Forbidden topics, lessons that'll get you criticized, called out or canceled. Uh, tonight we're on lesson number seven, and this is the second lesson in the uh, pro-life or pro-death uh, topic that, we're, um, that we are covering. So we've reviewed the different ways that abortions are performed, usually decided upon by the development of the baby. And the main ways, and i am do this very quickly tonight because we reviewed all of this in our last lesson. There's the suction method, the curatage uh, method, salt poisoning, dilation and extraction, which is the uh, partial birth abortion. And then one of the newer ones, the RU46, which is the abortion pill. And as I say, we, we, uh, we talked all about each one of these uh, last week, and if you missed that, obviously on the website or online, you can pick up lesson six and it'll give you all that information. Now, as gruesome as abortion is, there are a great number of people who not only support it as a viable birth control option, but actually they promote it vigorously. The defense of this practice comes uh, in the shape of several arguments, uh, which I again began to discuss in the last uh, lesson. For example, uh, abortion is okay because the fetus, well, it's not human. That was, it's an old argument, one of the very first ones. And of course, the idea that what is removed from the mother, there was a time when it was thought, well, it's nothing more than just a mass of cells. Uh, and that, that flew you know, 50, 75 years ago, but not today, refuted by the fact that fertilized eggs begin to demonstrate human characteristics long before they are deemed viable uh, by abortionists. And so the thing that a woman conceives is not a tumor. She doesn't conceive a tumor or a thing. She conceives a living person who needs only time and nourishment to become a fully developed human being. Put in another way, 100% of female pregnancies in all of history have resulted in human babies. <laughs> you know, so if, you, if you're a gambling person and you'd like to gamble on something that has pretty good odds, you, you can bet on that. You can bet that the, if, if a woman conceives, there's, it's a human being inside of her and not something else, okay? 100% of the time. Another uh, argument that's presented is abortion is purely a matter of choice. And of course, the pro-choice movement sees abortion as the sole and undeniable right of a woman to choose what will happen to her body. Of course, both women and men should be free to use the gift of free will and choice that God gave to humans, but God does not permit a person the freedom to kill another person. Nobody has that freedom. Freedom and choice have limits, and one of these limits is when our choice harms another person or destroys another person. Uh, we, we, so choice is not you know, uh, without limits. Uh, another argument, and that is abortion is okay because it protects the mother. Now, some pregnancies are the result of rape or incest. Some pregnancies will produce sick or deformed children. Some may even threaten the life of the mother, all very rare instances, but there are times when these things happen. The pro-choice answer to all of these scenarios is the same, and that is to abort the child because this solution will best serve the mother. But psychologists tell us that even in these extreme cases, Abortion doesn't necessarily serve the woman best, and it certainly does no good to the innocent child who is, you know, who is murdered. There are other options that will better serve the mother spiritually and emotionally, as well as physically. 
but they are not as you know, a quick fix as abortion. Uh, and abortion is always promoted as a quick fix. You go in with the problem and a few hours later you leave and your problem is fixed. It's done, it's over with. You go back to living your life. That's what they say. That's not necessarily, uh, necessarily true. So today I'd like to discuss the last couple of arguments used by the pro-choice people and discuss, of course, what does the Bible teach about this uh, subject? Now, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll admit this right away and I think it's pretty obvious. I'm not a woman, really. I, I don't identify as a woman. <laughs> I don't feel like a woman, you know. I'm not a woman in any way. And I'm sure that there are certain experience and issues that I may be missing here, you know, simply because I'm a man. I, I can't feel or, you know, there are many, uh, many ways that I can't relate to this because of my gender. Uh, but my purpose today is to at least reveal what the two sides of the argument are and lay before you some, spirit, uh, some pertinent scriptures that uh, will deal with the issue. So a couple of more arguments for uh, abortion. One, overpopulation. You don't hear this one very much, but it used to be a pretty popular argument. Abortion is necessary because the world is uh, rapidly becoming overpopulated. Again, partial truths mixed in with the lie to push the abortion agenda. Now we know that uh, there are parts of the world that are overcrowded and that are struggling to have food and water and other resources. Their problem is not overpopulation, their problem is improper distribution of resources, that's the problem. Greed fuels high prices and stockpiling, which penalizes poor countries. I mean, I know, in, you know, having grown up in Canada, I knew this, we learned this in school even, that the farmers would grow too much wheat out in the Western promises, too much wheat, and they would burn it. I mean, they had so much wheat, they could feed an entire country, you know, an entire other country with the, with the surplus in wheat, but they didn't do that. They didn't give that wheat away. They didn't send it to a poor country or anything like that. They burned it. Why? To keep the price high. That's why. To maintain price levels, to maintain profit. There's enough food and there's enough water in the world to care for every single person. The problem is that sinful people hoard much of it or they waste much of it. And this results in suffering, not for the rich, but for the poor. Now, the world's population will explode. This is another argument. The world's population will explode if we don't do something about it. There are certainly concentrations of overcrowding in certain developing countries, but again, this is not our problem in the West. You can't use that, pro you can't use that argument here for, uh, for abortion. You know, in, in, in spite of propaganda to the contrary, Western civilization is dying out. I mean, in order to maintain the Western world's population, each woman needs to produce 2.1 children. I know, I never figured out the 0.1, but we'll leave the mathematicians, uh, you know, their specialties. Each woman needs to produce 2.1 children. That's just to maintain the population. In Western Europe and Canada, the United States, the average is 1.8 child per couple. In Italy, Italy is the fastest dying country with an average of 1.3 child uh, per woman. Now, to compare this, in 1900, Western nations had 30% of the world's population. In 1950, it had 22%. In 1995, 15%. By 2030, it'll have 9%. By the year 2100, 4% of the world's uh, population. You know, why do you think there's 
so much stress about immigration. You, know, you wonder why is there stress about immigration? I don't want to go into the politics of it. I'm just saying there's always stress in every country about, about immigration. Well, if your own population is not repopulating your country and you're, a, you know, you're a, like in Canada, you're a 35 million uh, you know, uh, number of, of people in that country to make it operate the way it operates, if it, sh if it shrinks down to 20 million, that, that means the, the standard of living is going to shrink down to 20, you know, is going to shrink in comparison. Uh, a country needs to replenish its population. And if its own native population doesn't populate the country, well, how else are you going to populate it? Well, with people from other countries. You know, numbers are numbers. That's why there's such, you know, stress going on. But our self-indulgent lifestyle, our sexual diseases, increasing abortion, dismantling of the traditional family, all of these things are contributing to the eventual demise of not only this country, but Western civilization as we know it. I mean, you know, if, if you get to reading material beyond Facebook and YouTube, you, know, you, you get to find out what the real problems uh, of the world are. And this, the decline of the Western civilization, that's a real problem. Abortion is just the most obvious sin of a civilization that continually mutilates itself. <laughs> the things we do to ourselves in this, uh, in this country. Researchers have also shown that in the third world or in developing countries, the threat of overpopulation is also slowing down as birth rates decline in their places as well. For example, the average was 6.1 children per woman in the 1970s. In the 2020, that has gone down to four children per uh, women. So the point is that the threat of overpopulation is overblown. And even if it were so, abortion would not have to be the best solution for that. There are other ways of controlling population that don't involve abortion at all. And anytime you mess around, you know, trying to control population, ask China, you know, ask the Chinese and their you know, one child policy in Montreal. Uh, we had several Chinese uh, uh, brethren who were part of our congregation who had come from China in like they were first generation, you know, they lived, they, they lived and grew up in China and they, they, they emigrated to Canada and they talk about that one child policy, absolutely. And they thought they were going to solve their overpopulation problems. Well, <laughs> they didn't do that. Now there are too many, you know, there are too many women. They're, they're not enough, excuse me, there are not enough women for the men. So you've got all these single men that can't, you know, that can't find a partner because you know, the, what people were doing was, well, we're only allowed to have one child. Uh, so uh, uh, if, uh, if my wife is pregnant, we find out it's a girl, let's abort that. Let's just keep aborting till we get a boy because you know, they wanted to carry on the family name uh, a, a boy could grow up and help support the family and so on and so forth. So when you start playing at God, not a good, uh, not a good result. And we, we see an example of that in, a, in, an, in another country. Um, another argument, let's get back to what we're talking about, the arguments for abortion. So one of them is overpopulation, uh -uh, it won't fly. Another argument is that pro-life people don't really care. Us, for example, we don't really care. Here, pro-choice people deviate from the issue of abortion and they make the argument personal. The accusation is that pro-life people don't care about the suffering and the struggle in raising a child that a woman has to go through. We don't, the accusation is we don't care about her it's easy to march in the street, they say, and to denounce and frighten pregnant women and then simply go home and offer no help whatsoever. 
again, if this were totally true, they might have a point, but the accusations are not, are not accurate. Pro-life people have done things to raise awareness of this issue, and some have become radical, even destructive, in their zeal. For example, destroying property or killing people you know, have nothing morally or legally in common with a cause that is dedicated to preserving the dignity of life. So some crackpot goes off and murders an abortion doctor, you know, that, that doesn't solve a thing. You know, we're, we're pro-life. The last thing we want to do is take someone, an, an innocent person's life. That's not what we do. There's an exception. It happened once or twice. Uh, I don't think it's a, uh, I don't think it's a, uh, you know, uh, something that we have to worry about that happens every day because it doesn't. Of course, pro-choice people have focused on a few deranged people in the pro-life movement and made them the model for all anti-abortionists. Now this is a good PR tactic, but you know, it's not true. The truth of the matter, however, is that the caring and the loving option is the one that has the interest of both the mother and the child at heart, not just the baby, but the mom too. Most pro-life counseling centers offer guidance as far as what will happen to the child once it is born, but also there is support and encouragement for the mother while she goes through the pregnancy. Now I might add that Christians from the very beginning have been the main defenders of the unborn and the pro-choice uh, pro group will never equal the, uh, to, uh, the contribution to society as far as care and compassion that Christians and churches and you know, organizations have made uh, in this fight. Uh, remember one thing, the, the pro-life movement makes no profit from their advocacy. You know what I'm saying? If, you're a, if, you're, if, you're, if you work for pro-life or you, you work for a pro-life organization or something like that, you don't have a 200 million bucks in the bank. You're supported by people who believe in your cause, and churches, so on and so forth. No, 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 it's the pro-choice side. It's the pro-abortion side that gets millions of dollars from the government and from corporations and from uh, you know, individuals. They're the ones that are getting rich performing abortions. The anti-abortionists, the pro-life people, none of them are getting rich. You know, if you're pro-life, it's, it's a moral choice. It's according to conscience. Just for example, you know, uh, some of the people, and there are a way a lot more in this, but just an example, you know, Justin Bieber, we all know who Justin Bieber is, right? The entertainer, recording artist. His, his mom was a teenager when she was pregnant and considered abortion, but changed her mind and decided to, to have the baby. And that baby grew up to be Justin Bieber. Uh, uh, Steve Jobs, remember him? Apple, the co company Apple. His birth mom chose to give him up for adoption instead of having an abortion. Uh, Tim Tebow, you know, the athlete, Christian athlete, his mother was advised to abort him and she refused and had him instead. What a, what a wonderful young man he is that he has turned out to be and a great advocate for uh, pro-life causes. And then uh, just the show business note here, Andrea Bo uh, Bocelli, you know, the blind opera singer. The doctors advised his mother to abort because the baby might have disabilities, might be blind. And she refused. And what happened? Her blind baby grew up to be a world famous opera singer. I mean, the list of these, you know, as much, you know, scientists and all kinds of uh, people who have made great contributions to society 
whose mothers were told, you know, you really don't want to take a chance. It happened even in our congregation in Montreal. I remember her, her name was, well, I forget her first name, but Mrs. Green, she, uh, Africa. You know, when you say African-American, you just cut off the American. She was African who had emigrated to Canada. And she was, uh, they, had, they already had three children. They were members of the church. And, um, and she was very sick in the hospital and she was carrying twins. And the doctors had come to her and uh, pleaded with her to abort because she was not well and there was a chance that these babies would you know, not make it and why go through all of this and blah, blah, blah. And I remember going to visit her at the hospital and she didn't ask me, what should I do? She didn't say, you know, she, didn't, she didn't put that on my shoulders. She didn't put that on my shoulders. She knew what she wanted to do. She says, I'm going to have these babies, but I'm, I'm afraid. Will you pray with me? Sure, I'll pray with you now and I'll just keep on praying. You know, I'll, I'll have these babies and if I die, I die, but I, you know, or if they die, they die, but I, I'm, I'm not going to be the one to take their life. If God wants to take their life, he can do that, but I'd, I'm not going to be the one to do that. And she went ahead and had those babies. It wasn't easy, it wasn't easy birth and everything, but they came out, they were healthy, they grew up, you know, a couple of years later in the church running around. A marvelous story of faith from Mrs. From Mrs. Green. So there may be some other arguments for abortion, but the five that I've discussed here are the major points of disagreement. So let's take a look at what the Bible teaches us about this particular issue. Now, as in many other issues, the Bible does not say thou shalt not abort. Be nice, but you, you won't find that in the Bible. But it does give us several principles that guide us when we're thinking about this particular issue, and this is what I want to share with you. First idea, the unborn genuinely possess human life. They're not things. You know, when they refer to them as a fetus, that doesn't mean, you know, by referring to it as a fetus, doesn't mean that it is not human. Fetus is just one stage of human development. You know, you're a fetus and then you're unborn, then you're, then you're a baby and then you're a toddler and then you're a teenager and then, you know what I'm saying? So just calling it a fetus doesn't mean it's, it's not human, it's just at a particular stage of, of development. But the unborn genuinely possess human life. Jesus Christ himself made the transition from divine to human, how? through conception and birth, Philippians 2.7, says he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And in the likeness of men, men are not just poof and they appear. You know, in the likeness of men means he began as a conceived being, just like all men are conceived he was conceived, the difference of course, is that he was conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit, but a woman carried him and a woman nurtured him and a woman gave birth to him and a woman you know, nursed him and you know, like other men. You know, it is said that the baby inside Elizabeth, uh, Mary's cousin, leapt for joy when Mary greeted Elizabeth, Luke chapter one, verse 44. Here the Bible is referring to that what, which was inside of Elizabeth as a human being. David, in talking about God's love, explains that God loved him, knew him, observed him, even before he came out of his mother at birth. He says, for you formed, you meaning God, you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my, my mother's womb. 
You know, throughout the Bible, the unborn are identified and given names and what they will be is prophesied. So God considers a person a person when they are conceived and his love for them begins at that point as well. Should our love not begin at the same time? If God begins to love the unborn at the moment they're conceived, isn't that when we should begin to love them? Another biblical point, unlawful killing is forbidden by God. Kind of the most obvious one. Of course, we know that not all killing is sinful. In certain cases, you know, death through accident, there's killing involved, but it was an accident. Is not, quote, sinful, or death in a war, or death through legal execution, or death through self-defense. God permits the taking of life in certain situations, but he has not authorized the government or doctors or pregnant women to kill the unborn for the matter of convenience. He's not permitted that. He has made some exceptions you know, to the taking of life, but that you kill the unborn because it'll be convenient? Yeah, he hasn't made that, you know, he hasn't given that permission to anybody. When we deliberately kill the innocent unborn, it's a sin and, and it's against God's law and we'll be punished for it. You know, God says, you shall not murder. Exodus 20 verse 13. And those who commit this crime and have not repented of it will be punished for it. Another biblical concept again, a happiness cannot be achieved through wealth and comfort. You know, there, there, there are life and death uh, uh, situations where abortions become a necessary option. We talked about that last time. But you know, the statistics show that most abortions are performed to avoid inconvenience or a financial burden. People who use this option to safeguard their lifestyle or their peace of mind or their financial soundness, they don't realize that the only way to find happiness or peace of mind and security is through faith in Jesus Christ and service to others in his name, not by a, you know, aborting your unborn child. <laughs> That's not gonna bring you peace of mind. On the contrary, on the contrary, that'll wound your soul. And even if you get forgiveness for that, that wound will still be there. How many people have I spoken to who have these kinds of wounds on their souls? Something they did, something they didn't do, you know, 30 years ago. And they were forgiven for it and they know that God loves them. And, everything, they know it up here, but the wound here is so deep that it still hurts. And believe me, killing your own unborn child is one of those deep wounds that, that women uh, uh, incur. And many times, many times because others have pressured them and not, and not themselves. Jesus said in Matthew 25 that the kingdom belongs to those who feed the hungry and feed the sick and the imprisoned and the poor and the thirsty. True contentment comes to those who care for those who are weak and helpless, not by amassing wealth or power and certainly not by just getting rid of the weakest of all. No one has ever claimed to have found peace and joy and lasting contentment through abortion, only some perhaps temporary relief. Oh sure, you know, there are those individuals that I think like to see themselves on TV who uh, go to public rallies 
and they boast about their abortions or they you know, chant how wonderful it is that they had an abortion or they, oh, by, they must be in, in, in Nirvana somewhere if they get invited on a TV show uh, you know, and somebody gives them a platform on a television show to be able to describe just how happy they are, you know, uh, how happy they are to have an abortion. And I, you know, I've had five abortions and the best day of my life is when I had the abortion. Sure, yeah, keep telling yourself that. I don't know if that's what you'll be thinking 20 years from now. And I don't even know if that's what you think when you're all by yourself, by yourself. You know, we live in a time where our society has become very sophisticated when it comes to sin. In a way, we resemble the Corinthian church who didn't see anything wrong with a man who was having sex with his father's wife. Apparently it wasn't his maternal you know, mother, but it was his mother-in-law I would be, or his stepmother, but anyways. The church didn't see anything wrong with that, just whatever, you know, part of the times. And of course, Paul took them to task. Today, LGBTQ groups march in the streets. They flaunt their sexual immorality in the face of the nation with the approval of our highest elected officials. Used to be a, a, there used to be a gay pride parade, then there was a gay pride day, now we have gay pride month. <laughs> there are more Italians in the United States than gay people, we don't get a month. We don't even get a day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we use God's name in vain, publicly, in movies, on television, and we applaud the people. Yes, sir, we applaud the people who do this. We pay money. We pay money to go watch a movie where the actors will be using the Lord's name five, 10, 25 times throughout the, throughout the movie. You know, I, I've told you this before, I'm, I'm, I'm a one man protest, you know. Uh, if I'm watching a movie and they use the Lord's name, that's it, that's the end of the movie. Click, off goes the movie. I don't care if we're in the middle of it. And I confess, I don't always have the strength to, to do that. But it's what I'm shooting for. It's what I'm shooting for. We kill the unborn out of convenience and our highest courts cannot even discern that a human life has been taken and they refuse to extend the protection of law to the most helpless of our citizens and that is the unborn. You'd think that that would be a no brainer, but oh no. Sophisticated, well-educated, you know, PhD level men and women they can't see this. It's been said that you measure the greatness of a nation by how it treats its weakest members. If this is so, then the time of our greatness is past because we promote the killing of the unborn. And through the influence of you know, movie stars and abortion lobbyists, Many states are drafting laws that will make it easier, easier to kill those who are too old or too weak or too sick to be valuable anymore. Believe me, it doesn't stop just at abortion. If you, can, if you can have a law that permits a doctor to, to, to take a baby that's fully grown you know, the partial birth abortion and, and suck out its brain in order to kill it and then pull it out of the mother, you know, or even a law where you can take a live baby that survives an abortion attempt 
and the baby somehow survives and is still alive and they're saying, well, keep them comfortable for the moment while the mom and I have a little discussion here about what we want to do. And if they decide, yeah, no, we, we really want the, uh, we really don't want it, okay. <coughs> what kind of country we're living in? What kind of society is this? You know, as Christians, uh, we sometimes feel helpless in the face of such overwhelming wickedness. And I, I, I don't have a better word. You know, I'm looking for a word, wickedness. And it's easy to lose heart and feel that there's nothing that we can do. We need to remember, however, that Christians have always been the minority. We have always been the voice crying in the wilderness. We have always been at odds with the conventional wisdom and the conventional morality as we are today. And so when it comes to abortion, what can we do as Christians? Well, first of all, we can teach our children about sex and do it early before uh, screen, before the screen starts teaching them about sex. The world teaches our daughters to dress immodestly and to use sex to be popular and to abort the babies they don't want. That's the lesson from the world to our daughters. It teaches our young men that sex is power and that their only responsibility is to protect themselves and their partner from disease or unwanted pregnancy. That's the only lesson you need to teach your young men. I'm so sick, I'm driving you know, the, the car and, and I, I, you know, I'm listening to er, the radio and there are some radio stations here. That, uh, you'd think, you'd think that the, great, the greatest disease happening in Oklahoma City is men not being able to have sex. I mean, there's so many clinics in town, men's clinics, men's health clinic. And you know what the operative word is in all the commercials? The word perform. It's always the same. What's the matter, boy? You know, what's the matter, uh, men? You want to perform? Are you not performing? And I'm thinking to myself, are they talking about the intimacy that takes place between a man and a woman? And are they referring to the part that, man, that the man plays as performing? Don't ask why <laughs> these guys are having problems <laughs> if they're thinking that <laughs> the part that they play in the intimacy between a man and a woman is performing. <laughs> I mean, you know, have we gone absolutely out of our minds? We need to teach our children that sex is powerful, but its power is destructive when used outside of marriage. And one of the destructive things is the abortion that some people will be tempted to have as a result of an unwanted pregnancy. See, that's another thing this generation isn't being taught that I talked about in another sermon on Sunday, and that is you own the consequences of your decisions. Remember that sermon on Sunday? You want your children to grow up you know, and have a chance? Teach them to own the consequences of their decisions. Oh, you're 17 and you're pregnant. Yeah, well you own it now. That's your baby. We're going to help you. And you're going to make the best of it, but that's your baby. Another suggestion here before the time runs out, vote for pro-life candidates. And again, I'm not being, trying to be political here, but you want abortion laws to be you know, removed? Well, you're going to have to have somebody that doesn't believe in abortion you know, in politics. Thankfully, we live in a country where the people, even Christians, have some influence in choosing their leaders. Politicians can ignore letters and they can ignore marches and sermons for sure, but they pay attention to the ballot box that they pay attention to. 
We have a right to elect officials who promote and uphold Christian standards and where a man and woman stands on the abortion issue will usually tell you where they stand on other moral issues as well. Uh, what I don't understand, again, uh, I'm getting myself into trouble again, but it's not that I don't care. It's just, it has to be said. How can you vote? How can you vote for a guy who promotes same-sex marriage, promotes it? How can you vote for a guy or a woman who promotes abortion, who's all out for abortion, never mind what they think about the economy. How can you vote for people like that? You got what you voted for. If you don't usually vote, then I encourage you, please do so when you have a chance. And when you do, support the people who uphold what is right instead of what is popular. We, we, we bear responsibility for the people we vote for and we bear responsibility for what they do. Believe me, if you voted uh, for the president that we have now and down the line, then you own what they decide. You own it. It's on you. Just remember that. Don't give me any of your political gobbledygook. You own it. And then finally, no, one more after this. Have mercy on the mothers and have mercy on the babies. Pro-choice usually promotes the welfare of the woman exclusively. And the pro-life people have fo uh, focused on the ethical and moral issue of abortion without giving due consideration or assistance to the actual people. What's needed is mercy and kindness, support for both mother and child, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the color. It doesn't matter the color. Sometimes this means acceptance and forgiveness when the mother is your own daughter or a friend or a partner. Sometimes it means contributing and helping the organization that serves the mom and the unborn. You know, if the people who are here making this a, a more welcoming and loving world, perhaps women would be more willing to bring their babies to birth irregardless of the way that they were conceived. And then finally, now I mean it, don't be discouraged. The aborted babies, they're going to be with God in heaven. They're going to be with God in heaven. And the guilty who committed and supported abortion, they will be judged. So I hope this uh, lesson has been enlightening I want it to be encouraging and I invite anybody who needs the prayers of the church. You know, if, if, if you've had an abortion in the past and you haven't specifically called out to God for forgiveness for that, do that. I'll pray with you. I mean, we don't have to do it publicly. You can call me, come see me, I'll pray with you. Or you, if you're a guy, and you paid to have your girlfriend have an abortion and all of a sudden you realize you own that abortion, it's on you. And you need to ask God to forgive you for that. I mean, if you're a Christian and you need somebody to pray with you, I'll pray, for, I'll pray with you for sure. And if you're not a Christian, <laughs> then by all means, call out to God confess his son, be buried in the waters of baptism, allow him to wash you clean, all the sins, even this nasty one, all of them are forgiven once and for all in the waters of baptism. All right, well, that's our cheerful lesson for tonight. Hope everybody is happy as they walk out. I'm not shooting for happiness. I'm shooting for understanding. I'm shooting for, you know the score. On this, particular, on this particular issue. Next week we'll continue. I'll find another forbidden topic and we'll explore that one as well. All right, thanks for your attention. We're finished for tonight.